And today we're going to be hearing about uh, OpenXDMod, and this is going to be delivered by uh, Joe at the uh, University of Buffalo. And I believe uh, Joe has a couple of co-presenters with him as well that he can introduce. Uh, so Joe, if you can hear me and you're unmuted, uh, please take over. Hi, thank you. So I'm, yeah, I'm uh, Joe White at the Center for Computational Research at the University of Buffalo. And uh, also with me is Robert DeLeon, who's also at the Center for Computational Research. Um, 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 Bob is going to give you a little overview, and then I'm going to try and do a live demo of, of XDMod. So I'll, I'll hand over to Bob. Okay, um, my name is Bob DeLeon. I'm the uh, program project manager on uh, XMS program, which uh, under which the Open XDMod has was developed. And I'm just going to give you a brief uh, overview of what of the project and uh, uh, Open XDMod, and then uh, as Joe said, he'll give you a, a demo. Um, let's see, how do I get this? Uh, okay. Well, first, a little bit of an overview of the talk here where uh, XDMod was developed uh, on the NSF uh, funding and uh, basically it was developed to monitor to exceed cyber infrastructure. And then OpenXDMod was an outgrowth of that, which we developed this, a similar version to look at university business, other national laboratory uh, uh, cyber infrastructure. We've also expanded in other directions. It was originally developed for HPC and now we've done clouds and, and so on. So I'll talk a little bit about that, some of the components of OpenXDMod, and then give you a little contact information. Uh, so the, the program, as I said, is funded by um, NSF and we've developed XDMod. And the goal really is to provide uh, historical information on performance and utilization on HPC uh, centers. And uh, we, in, in addition, we're trying to measure the quality of service of them and also measure, uh, uh, to, you know, to give information to, so you can do upgrades, procurements, database uh, uh, upgrades. So OpenXD mod uh, is the open source version for data, data centers. We have uh, over 300 uh, users now in the academic industrial uh, worldwide. So the OpenXD mod portal uh, is is uh, intended to ma monitor uh, usage and performance. Uh, the other components that we have uh, that go with that are the application kernels, which are lightweight uh, um, applications or uh, benchmarks for which we have uh, used to measure quality of service. And another thing we're, Joe's going to talk about later is the job viewer. I'm not going to talk about the scientific impact, although we have a program to measure, to curate publications and to measure the exceed scientific impact, but that's really more the exceed version. So XDMod is web-based. It displays a whole variety of metrics on utilization, performance, scientific impact, et cetera, et cetera. It's also role-based uh, in a sense that we can, uh, you can configure it so that you, the people who are the center directors can look at all of the jobs and the users can only look at their own jobs or set it up however you like. There's also a, a custom report builder that Joe's gonna talk briefly about. And, but uh, the, in general, what uh, you see is what you, uh, uh, the kind of things you can get out of uh, OpenXD mod is this, the, the chart shown here which shows a few years worth of month by month uh, utilization uh, on, our, on our, our particular uh, cluster here. It's got the blue, the blue is the number of jobs and the red is the CPU hours. So that's the kind of information you could get out of it. Another thing you might be interested in looking at is for example, who is using your, uh, your, your system? And we're looking at a breakdown here in terms of the, the biggest user here is the School of Engineering and then the College of Arts and Sciences. Now we can, for example, drill down and, and look at what the School of Engineering usage looks like down to the department level. And we're looking at here, again, the CPU uh, usage and the, uh, and the number of jobs. Another thing you might be interested in seeing is what are people doing with, the, with, your, with your cluster? And this is a, an example drawn from the Blue Waters analysis that we did using XDMod. And it turns out on Blue Waters, the NAMD, NAMD is the 
number one job in terms of the number of CPU hours, but Amber is the number one job in terms of number of uh, jobs that are launched. Um, the next thing is the, uh, the next thing I'd briefly like to mention is the quality of service, which we do with the application kernels. Uh, again, application kernels are benchmarks or lightweight uh, applications that are submitted as just as a user would. So instead of the user uh, finding uh, problems or uh, with sub subsystems in your in your uh, cluster, uh, we can proactively determine what's going on by running the application kernels on a periodic basis. So for example, the, the example I've got here shows the Stampede 1 where we were running IOR for a while and it, it was everything was going great in October. And then on October 20th, the, the parallel file system performance dropped way off. Now it didn't completely crash, so there was still something going on. So the users might not have even been aware of the fact that things were just running slower, but, it, but the, the performance fell off quite a bit. So we informed TAC of this and they eventually ended up fixing the problem. Another uh, use case for application kernels, and I think Joe's going to talk about this a little bit more detail, is uh, when the uh, spectra and meltdown uh, vulnerabilities were uh, were detected, and they and they patched the system. And so we were looking at we had already been monitoring before the patches, and then we we monitored the the, uh, the same jobs after the patches, and we could detect what the uh, what the performance impact of those patches was. Uh, and then finally, I just briefly mentioned the OpenXD mod job viewer, where you can measure individual job performance. Uh, we do it with using uh, CPC, uh, PCP, uh, Performance Copilot, but other groups use tax stats, Ganglia, LDMS, where you, you collect hardware counter data to get a variety of different uh, types of metrics, CPU usage, memory usage, I.O. usage. And the idea is to try to detect uh, poorly performing users, applications, and so on. Uh, I want to make a new slide for this one because the old one was pretty old a, a couple days ago. So it took me a, a total of three jobs to find this particular job here, which shows a, a, a job that's being run in which uh, with 24 CPU, 24 CPUs. And as you can see, one CPU is doing a great job. It's uh, 100%. And the other 23 CPUs are completely idle. So this particular job is using roughly 4% of the resources and wasting the other 96%. So it doesn't matter for one job, but if this person, for example, was resubmitting this job periodically and uh, that was part of his normal workflow, you might want to, you could, uh, we are currently developing uh, notification processes for users uh, that have, uh, you know, a, inefficient uh, jobs and we might then you might want to go and uh, have user support have a chat with this person and say look you're you're wasting a lot of resources here uh, this can be the other good uh, thing you can do with the job viewer is to look at uh, you know your job performance you can look at memory usage and see if jobs are topped out on memory and, and failed because of that you can look at inefficiency as I pointed out before you can look at L1D Cache loads to see if your job is uniformly executing, or if it's, or if it's, uh, or if it's, it's stopped executing in, in the middle of the process. So finally, I just uh, talk about the, uh, the the team here, uh, mostly CCR members, uh, but uh, we also a team with uh, Indiana on the scientific impact, and and TAC has a small role in this. And uh, last but not least, uh, some contact information. These are the, the websites for XDMod, Exceed version, Open XDMod, uh, the help and uh, mailing list. Uh, and then uh, finally, I'd like to say we're going to be at the PERC 19 at the end of next month. And we're going to have a, a table there and a users group meeting there. So if you're interested in learning more about XDMod, uh, at, at that, that would be a good uh, time to, to talk to us about it. And so uh, now I'll just turn the uh, the podium over to uh, Dr. White here, who's going to give us a, a demo and then briefly talk about where to get a hold of uh, XDMod. Thanks, Bob. Right, just bear with me for one second while I switch over to a web browser. Let's 
sharing. Just okay, uh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a very, very quick um, overview of the types of things that we have in OpenXD Mod. Now, this isn't really intended to be a tutorial because there's so much stuff that we would cover, we would not have anywhere near enough time. So I'm going to really zip through things quite quickly. I really just want to give you an appreciation of the types of uh, things that you can do in XDMod and the capabilities that exist in there. And then at the end of this, I will give you some contact information about how folks can contact us if they want more information. As, as Bob mentioned, we're going to be at the PERC conference and we'll have a table there so we'll be able to talk, but we have a, an active mailing list and we also have uh, active support email that we do so that you can contact us in various different ways to provide more information. And we have as well, in addition, uh, done detailed tutorials about specific parts of XDMod. That generally requires a slightly larger amount of time and we try to want, prefer to focus on a specific uh, aspect of it. So what I'm going to show you today is the, uh, this is the web front end for the Open XDMod instance that we host here at our center. So this shows information from, uh, this shows information from the HPC resource we host at CCR. Uh, this is an academic HPC resource. It has uh, an approximately 1,500 compute nodes uh, that are spread into different partitions. We have a very diverse set of users, academic users from the university through to industrial users that work in partnership with the university. Uh, I'm just going to log out here. So when uh, you presented, when you go to the web address, and this is an internal address for our um, for our centre presented with the front landing page, which shows some summary information about the system. Now, all of the plots that you see on the summary page, you can configure uh, on a per site basis. So if you have this installed at your site, you can configure exactly what plots are displayed. And we just have some overview information showing the amount of usage of the system broken down in different ways over time. Um, and that's pretty much all that's available for somebody who's not logged in. Um, you can sign into the system and we have uh, XDMod tied into our university-wide shibboleth single sign-on system and XDMod in fact has hooks in it that will allow you to connect to different single sign-on systems via simple SAML PHP so for example you could connect a Facebook login if you if, if you so decide or uh, Globus we have Globus connectivity that we use for the Xseed version and in our case shibboleth that we use at our center um, so any users at the university already can use their existing account information. They don't need to set up different accounts in order to be able to use, use the software. So when you first logged in, I don't know if you noticed that there, it's basically a tab-based user interface. So we have a set of tabs that run across the top uh, that show different aspects of way to access information in the system. Um, on the top right, there's also information about how you get help from the system. So there's a user manual. Um, and then contact information. Now, if you install this at your site, you can set that contact information to connect to your help desk system. In our case, when they, uh, when users click send message here, it ends up sending an email to our internal help desk ticketing system so that then we can get, so that we can track usage of the system. Um, so as I say, the summary tab, main page, this just shows predefined sum, uh, summary information. When a user's logged in, actually, they can configure exactly which charts get displayed on their page, or they can leave it at the default values. Um, there's a usage tab, which uh, provides a sort of very quick, relatively simple way of accessing the data in the, in the system through simple plots with predefined settings in them. There's a metric explorer tab, which allows you to plot pretty much the same information that's available in the usage tab, but via a much more rich, complex interface. So some of the plots that Bob showed earlier where he was overlaying multiple different data sets onto the same plot, that was generated using this metric explorer, um, which provides a wide varying of different ways to filter and, and show multiple di different sets of disparate data on the same chart. Uh, we have a report generator that um, is used to allow you to construct uh, reports that, that can then be configured to be periodically sent to you via email or downloaded directly. Um, so, for example, our center director um, has his instant, has his login configured so that he every quarter he receives a, a detailed report showing the activity on the system over the last quarter and over the last year. And then he can use that information, get sent it as a Word document, and he can use the information that's contained in that report in order to report to his uh, to up the chain uh, to senior university folks. We have a job viewer, which allows you to do view 
So previously, all of the plots that we, we had been showing and are available in the interface are looking at aggregate data, for example, looking at cumulative counts of total amounts of jobs or total utilization over time or over a given time period. Job Viewer is the interface that allows you to drill all the way down and view uh, detailed information about an individual entity on the system. So we're mostly focusing on HPC jobs, so it allows us to view all detailed informa information about an individual HPC job that ran on a given center and provide search functionality to, in order to find those jobs. And then finally, we have an uh, About tab, which is just, again, more user, user, user information. In addition to uh, these tabs, uh, there's one other thing, which is the quality of service metrics, which I'm going to show you in a little bit, which is available. We currently don't have that quality of service enabled on our own center, uh, sorry, for display on our own center, uh, but we do have it available in the Exceed version, and I'll, I'll just show you the Exceed version. The App Kernels tab is available in the open source software. It's just that, just for historical reasons, we didn't have that enabled at, um, in our center. Um, okay, so I'm just going to start and just show you, give you a very quick overview of the types of information that we can store in XDMod. Um, so we, we break down the information by um, uh, really by data source. So we have this concept of the uh, what we call realms, and a realm really consists of a, a sort of a source of information, or it could be multiple sources of information. So the jobs realm, um, which I'm showing you some summary plots here, uh, consists of information collected from the uh, resource manager or job scheduler at, at the center. In our case, we use Slurm, but the software supports uh, all of the common uh, job schedulers of PBS, um, Talk, uh, uh, the names forget, I, I forget the other ones, but LSF. yeah, LSF, all, all of the common ones are supported. And it's a plugin based architecture, so if you have a particularly exotic resource manager, there's still a, a defined way in order to integrate the data into the system. Um, so by default, we have a summary page that shows multiple different information, such as, uh, for example, uh, you know, the weighted job size per job, total node hours, total core hours, uh, total number of jobs running over time, um, information about uh, job sizes, number of PIs active, expansion factors, wall hours, wait hours, a very large amount of information. And you can view an individual thing. So for example, if we wanted to look at, very quickly look at the total number of CPU hours served on the center over a given time period. In this case, it's defaulting to the previous month. So this plot is showing the total number of CPU hours uh, delivered uh, for HPC jobs running at, at our center over time. This little dip here is our defined, is our um, is a downtime, uh, scheduled downtime. Um, so what other information uh, do we have in the system? Well, we have, uh, we actually collect some information from our storage systems uh, including the uh, quota information, number of files active, number of bytes used, um, and we can view that in the system. So, for example, you know, we can look at the physical usage over time, and one of the things, as Bob mentioned, we have the ability to slice and dice this data in multiple different ways. So, for example, we can drill down the usage by department. This will provide a plot, and we, as you can see, I have detailed usage over time. I can change this plot around very quickly to view it in maybe a slightly easier to understand way uh, in a stacked plot. So we can look at the uh, stacked usage over time. You can see what the biggest user of our storage system consists of the biochemistry department. And then second from that is actually the XDTAS project, which is actually our project. And we're storing a large amount of historical data, not collected at our center, but also collected over the XSEED systems. And we can change the time range very easily. You know, if you want to look at two years worth of data, then yeah, select two years worth of data and now here's the usage over time. As you can see, we're, we're sort of peaking about a thousand terabytes over in late 2017. And I think then we had a little bit of a uh, re uh, removing some duplicate data and down, we're, now we're down to a sort of overall usage around the sort of 700 terabytes. But anyway, as you can see, you can very quickly bring up this information. Um, it gets displayed very quickly. We have deliberately designed the data warehouse backend in order to be able to like quickly serve out this information. Uh, what other stuff do we have? So we also have uh, we we have an open stack based virtual machine infrastructure, um, and we're collecting all the usage statistics on this cloud infrastructure as well, and that can be displayed in XDMod. So we can look at the number of um, uh, core hours delivered over time uh, for our cloud. And then have that also broken down by uh, 
lots of different ways, including you know individual users using it or the particular project that the that the cloud is running on. And again, there's different ways of displaying this information. So we can display in a time series information, but just as easily display that in a uh, as a as a bar plot as a cumulative total. So over this time period, in this case, this was a two-year time period. You know, this is the total number of core hours delivered by project. So this is, again very quickly be able to view this historical information and very quickly be able to change the, the settings and view in different ways. Uh, now it's all well and good having it available in the web interface but we can also export this in different ways so if you just have a simple plot that you wanted to include in a report you can export that in multiple different graphical formats. Um, we uh, have the PDF format if you're wanting to do it into an academic paper at high resolution or a PNG format that will quickly download. I think my share thing won't show that. And then there's also, uh, if you're wanting to analyze the data directly, uh, you can download it as a CSV format and then import it into your whatever data processing, external data processing software of your choice. So hopefully giving you a feel for some of the ways that you can view information in the in XDMOD. Uh, now another thing you can do is that you can, as I mentioned earlier, use the report generator to save multiple, one or more of these different plots and then have them periodically email to you and they will get updated with different settings. So you do click the available for report button and then we can switch over to the report generator and then the chart that I just created there now appears in the list of available charts. And I'm not going to go into all of the details of all of the specifics of how to operate this report generator but you can create new reports or you can have existing reports. This is a pre-created one that I have in the sit that is based on a template that we provide. And if we're interested in including this plot that we created in the report, it's as simple as dragging it on. Uh, it defaults to being at the bottom, but if we want to show in different parts of the report, we can move it around. And at that point, um, you can configure it to, in this case, this one is configured to send me an email in PDF format every quarter. Um, if I want to preview what it would look like, I can download it directly as either a PDF file or a Word document, <coughs> which will take a few seconds to run, and then we can view the information. So in this case, this is in a PDF format, which is of course a read only, but you can do it in a Word format if you want to subsequently edit the document or forward it onto anything else. So for so I mentioned the before the metric explorer tab and this provides much more rich way of slicing and analyzing the data with a, the trade-off being it's slightly more complex in terms of the number of, of things that you can possibly do and, and, and learning curve for it um, but it's organized in a very similar way to the usage tab so on the left hand side is a list of all the data that's available and then we can select let's have a look at say the total number of CPU hours um, broken down by uh, the CPU user value. And of course this can be a time series, so I'm just going to switch this over here and then change the here. So a few things I quickly rushed through there, but there's context sensitive menus on the charts. To allow you a huge range of different configuration settings so for example you can change the way that the chart is displayed and we have various different options uh, different stacking options we can change the sort order so the order in which the information is displayed on the system you can change the number of uh, data points that are shown you know so i could turn this down to only show four data points or like actually increase and like show all of the data points in the system um, you can click on the chart and then and then change the title interactively you can click on the, the axes and change change the things that's being displayed you can configure how the legend is displayed there are a huge number of different ways of, of, of using this to configure you can change the color of the plots um, huge number of different things uh, so what I'm showing you here apart from my uh, typo again just as easy to, uh, to edit that um, so I'm showing you the information collected from the job performance data that we collect in our center. So as Bob mentioned earlier, we happen to use uh, Performance Copilot. Uh, and this is sort of 
metrics collection software that runs on every one of the compute nodes uh, continuously. And the information that's collected from there is processed and then uh, aggregated by HPC job. So for every HPC job running on the system, we collect all of the performance metrics, bundle them all together, and then use that to generate statistics on an individual job. And then that information then is what you're looking at here. So for example, uh, over the last and the previous month, so in the month of May, you know, uh, there were nearly 5 million CPU hours jobs, all of which had more than 90% uh, CPU user efficiency. So most of the jobs running on the system by core hours are very efficient. Um, there's a decent chunk of like 1.6 million CPU hours for jobs that had low CPU usage. It doesn't necessarily mean they were efficient, it just means they had low CPU usage. But we have the, this information readily available so we can look at it. Now uh, we can, uh, one of the nice things about Metric Explorer is that we can filter the data however we want and there's a huge number of different filters available. So we could do something sort of sensible, say look at a subset of our HPC resource, just look at, for example, the academic uh, partition. So this is the, you, this, these will be the academic uh, computer users. And we can also filter by say, I don't know, the queue, let's look at uh, uh, so the large number of different queues uh, or partitions in slim terminology on the system, uh, we can easily have a search dialog box that allows us to filter and then we can select them very easily and add a filter. So now we're looking at the similar distribution as before, uh, but now we're only looking at our academic compute um, and just the large memory queues, so just the folks that are using the large memory machine. And as I say, the distribution looks very similar, but the point is, is that you can very quickly add these filters and look at different um, uh, data almost instantly. Um, uh, what other filters are available? Um, so those two were examples of sort of filters for like the accounting type information, but you can filter on other things. So for example, if we just wanted to look at jobs that were above a, uh, a certain number of uh, calls allocated, we could do that. Or if we wanted to add a filter for say the uh, size of the uh, the length of time that the job ran. So if we wanted to look at only jobs that ran for at least an hour, uh, then we could add that filter on there now, uh, and we get a sort of similar distribution. You'll notice that the distribution slightly changed in that the this NA this very small NA column disappeared. That was probably just the NA corresponds to where for whatever reason we were unable to collect the performance information for a job. Usually it can it, usually it's just a uh, something such as a very, very short running job, we didn't collect sufficient data points in order to be able to make a measurement from it. And obviously, clearly, uh, when you have long enough jobs, then we, we typically always get all the performance information. Uh, so from here, you can actually drill down and you can actually look at the actual individual HPC jobs that went into a data point. So when I click on the data point that I'm interested in, I click on show real data, and then that's actually gonna give me a list of all of the HPC jobs that went into that thing. So this is gonna be the list of HPC jobs that uh, we're running on the academic compute node, the larger memory queues that ran for longer than an hour and had less than 10% CPU usage. And then we get a selected, as you can see, there were 202 of these jobs. Uh, and then I can just, you know, pick one and click on it and then we get to, get to see it in the job viewer. So this is the job viewer tab that I showed you earlier and basically shows a varied amount of, of information about the jobs we collect. For example, we collect the jobs batch script that the job launched on so we could say that our uh, so that you can view that in the interface uh, we collect the information about the processes that are running on the on the compute nodes when the job was running so that we have access to that including what C groups the jobs were pinned to we collect a large amount of summary statistics such as the CPU usage um, in this case you know the energy usage for this job used like 2.8 2.5 uh, megajoules um, and an average max power consumption of like 250 watts and then file IO statistics, memory usage statistics, network statistics. Uh, we have the various accounting data, who ran the job, when did they run it, how much, what did they request, what did they use, when did it start, when did it end? And then also time series information available. So uh, what was the CPU usage of the job? In fact, since I selected this job by looking at jobs that had less than 10% CPU user, it looks like it was an average about 3% CPU user. And we can drill down and look at the individual CPU calls. So, uh, when I hover over, I get to see, it looks like this was basically a single uh, a job that ran on one of the uh, 32 cores um, and wasn't pinned. But remember, this was in the large memory queue. So this is per could be perfectly acceptable as long as they're using the 
uh, memory and we can look at that. So we can look at, say, the total node memory and here we go, the job's peaking around 90 gigabytes. Memory usage, uh, which is more than would fit on a normal compute node, so this is perfectly you know, reasonable thing for this user to be using large memory node for this. Uh, but we can see the time series pattern as well. Obviously, there's some sort of periodic behavior on here. Uh, so this job viewer interface is, um, has access controls on it. Bob mentioned earlier that we have role-based um, uh, access in XDMOD. Um, what that really means is that for a given user account, we assign a given role to that user account. So we have the concept of a normal user of the system. So that would be somebody who, say, <coughs> say a student um, who has, a, has the ability to view their own HPC jobs but can't view anybody else's HPC jobs. Uh, a PI who then has the ability to view their own HPC jobs and also the, PI, the, the jobs of the people working on their projects or their students. And then centre staff who have access to all of the jobs of the system uh, running at the centre and then the centre director who also has access to all of the jobs running at the centre. So one of the ways that this job viewer interface is used, partly it's for user self-help. So because users can see their own jobs, they can log in, they can look up their job. Uh, if something went wrong, they have the ability to view some of the statistics that are collected automatically. Um, it's also very useful for our centre support staff. Um, so when they receive a support ticket uh, of a user complaining that they had a problem running their job or something didn't work properly, they can quickly use the interface to bring up the information about the job and, in fact, the historical usage of the other jobs that the users run, which will help provide context to help them uh, answer the questions as efficiently as possible. So, so one of the ways they do that is via this direct search interface that we have in the job viewer. Um, there's two main ways of accessing jobs. One is if you know the HBC job information yourself, you can do a direct lookup and view it. So an example of this would be um, our centre support staff receiving a ticket saying, oh, I had a problem running my um, industry job and this was the job ID. So then they can just type that job ID directly in. Um, they spell it correctly. Um, and then view the job uh, in the system directly. Again, they have access to all of the information. Uh, we collect the job scripts, uh, executable information with summary metrics. Um, and one thing I didn't mention before is at the top here, we just have a set of uh, traffic lights, what we, we call them traffic lights. They're basically just a sort of at a glance summary of a couple of the key metrics that we think might be useful for doing diagnosis. In this case, we have, we normalize this information to show if it shows as green, then that really corresponds to a high usage of the, of the particular metric or a good usage of the particular metric. And if it shows as red, it typically means like a low usage or, a, or a, something that you might, be in, might want to look at. In this case, actually, this job is uh, uh, has high CPU usage, about 91%. Good CPU user balance, as in all of the cores that were assigned to the job were used approximately at the same rate. Uh, a reasonable memory headroom, meaning that it didn't reach the uh, maximum amount of memory uh, used by the job. Uh, but it has this low homogeneity score, which means that uh, it wasn't uniform usage over time. So if we look at, say, the CPU user value, this job, you can see they're pegged at 100% for uh, several uh, several hours and a couple of days, in fact. Um, which is, but then in the last uh, last couple of hour, last hour and a half of the job, the CPU usage just dropped off a cliff and then stayed low at the bottom at the end, which is the reason why they get a red mark in this box. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong necessarily with this job, but it's again it's just useful information that we can feed back to. Uh, to users and to our support staff so they can get a clue about where to look. Uh, in this case, they have access, you know, we can bring up the CPU usage information or we can look at the, you know, the, in, the interconnect usage. So, you know, a sort of steady interconnect usage and then it like pulls off the cliff again. Um, and look at, say, the, the uh, memory usage and you can see that this is this must have been a multi-node job. Yeah, so this was a, uh, um, you know, how many nodes? Yeah, so this was a 16-node job. Uh, and you can see all of 15 of the nodes all had sort of like fairly much the same memory usage, but one node was uh, had increasing memory usage up until the end. So this again is not uh, this in itself won't is not all of the information you would need in order to diagnose problems with your HPC jobs, but it's an but it's a useful 
information that you have ac quick access to that you can use as part of the diagnostic process. process. And this is available, as I say, to uh, users themselves, so they can do user self-help, but also to the support staff, so they can also provide assistance to users. So that was about all I was going to talk about um, for the job viewer. Now we're going to switch over to uh, talk about the quality of service metrics and information that's available in XDMOD via the App Kernels module. Uh, so I'll just switch tabs here. I'm just going to show you the RxE instance, which has the App Kernels enabled on it. Um, but as I say, if you you can install the App Kernels module in the open source software. Um, so what we're showing, <coughs> so this is the App Kernels interface. Um, shows what the app kernels are, are uh, we provide a set of configuration files as well as the infrastructure in order to parse them and configure software that runs effectively as a normal user on the HPC resource. And we have a handful of different things that we have pre-configured. They're a mix of uh, bench, typical benchmarks like the, well, the Limpack HPCC benchmark or the IOR um, benchmark software as well as uh, community applications that we think are rep that, that you can choose to be representative of the applications that run in your system. So for example, we include Namdi, NWChem, uh, Enzo, Games, Graph 500, well, Graph 500 is a benchmark, uh, different software. And these run as a normal user on the system. And one of the benefits of this is that they will catch um, problems that normal users would see because they're running as a normal user. And we run the same set of configuration every time that it runs. So at our center, we have, uh, let's see, let's bring up there. Um, for a given software application, and we're viewing the information for Namdi here, we collect a small set of metrics. In this case, I think we look at the sort of amount of time it took for the program to run. Bear in mind that it has the same input settings every time, so we're expecting it to take the same amount of time to execute every time. Uh, some measure of the simulation performance, which I think is a metric from Namdi itself, and then the uh, total amount of memory used, um, which again you're expecting it to be the same time, same every time it runs. So if we look at say the wall clock time, Namdi, this is uh, so this is running at our center over the uh, previous month. Um, you can see that it shows the amount of time it took to run. We run in multiple different modes, so we have a single node, two nodes, four nodes, eight nodes, which allows us to scan a different uh, see the different operating modes of the software, folks running in parallel versus a, versus a singular, and then you can drill down and view um, detailed information about the actual amount of time it took over time. Now we have automatic software that runs here that tries to detect when there's any measurements that are, in con that are out of control. And by that what we mean is that we maintain a running average uh, so every time the software runs, as I say, it has, the, it has the identical configuration settings. So in an ideal world, it would take exactly the same time to run and have exactly the same performance me me metrics. In reality, though, that's never the case. There's always slight variations day to day. Um, so we have some automatic software in place that like, looks at each uh, measurement and compares it and then tries to detect when there's a variation that's, that is unexpected or without of a, a given uh, out of the given range. So as you can see, for example, this plot shows that on the uh, uh, on the 8th of May, when it ran, it took quite significantly longer to run than on previous days. Um, and the, the software can, can be configured so that you can get an email alert if this happens, and you can configure a wide range of settings to say what you decide is actually like bad. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, Bob mentioned earlier was that uh, that we did some analysis on the the, the um, spectrum meltdown patches. So one of the things that we one of the great things that we had about that is that we had a long historical information about these processes running on our center. And when we applied the patches, we could then compare about what it was looking like before to what it looked like what it looked like after the patches were applied. And we already and this was already in there. We didn't have to do any extra work because we were already collecting all of this information. So we had it readily and we were able to write that up very quickly. And also understand what happened. So I think I was looking up the uh, I think the meltdown patches were applied in the like, January 2018. I think was the uh, so just going to change this time range and we'll look at the thing. So so this is the plot of the Namdi the amount of time it took to run our NAT two node Namdi app kernel over time, starting from late 2017 up until 
uh, uh, August 2018. And we have an automatic thing in here that detects when the system infrastructure changes. So I can turn that on and there's a little exclamation, uh, exclamation mark within a, with a, in, a, in a triangle indicating that it detected that there was a system configuration change. And in this case, I happen to know that the system configuration change that happened in, uh, on the 8th of January was when we upgraded the kernel to include the one that had the patches for Spectra and Meltdown uh, workarounds. And what we observed was that before that, we were getting the occasional spike once in a while where the NAMD performance was much slower than, than the typical performance. But after that point, it was almost always worse and also had much larger variation. So this continued up until um, up until uh, this, like the July 2018, when we subsequently updated, when more patches came out. And in fact, when those patches were applied, the performance sort of went back and actually went to about the same as the performance we had before. Um, so this is, this is just sort of illustrative of the fact that we're already collecting all of this information, and then we can very quickly bring it up and have a look at it and analyze it without any difficulty. Uh, and the important things about this is that we're running the same software every time automatically so that we can track these things down and, and find these problems without users knowing, without users having to notice. So in this case, for example, uh, not that there's much that could be done about it because the patches needed to be applied, but um, users may not have even necessarily noticed there was anything particularly wrong. Their jobs may have taken longer to run, longer to execute, but unless they we're already hitting against their wall time, they may not actually realize that there's a problem at all, but at least we're able to characterize exactly what the impact on the system is. I think one of the other examples Bob gave before was when there was a sort of, we've had examples where we've had a bug in a, a firmware upgrade that triggered a bug in the file system that caused the performance to drop through the floor. And again, actually the users in that case didn't notice. We didn't have any support tickets that they were complaining apart from I think one person. Uh, but we were able to notice because we we're running this infrastructure and then we were able to diagnose exactly when the problem occurred, which allowed us to quickly diagnose exactly what, what had happened and fix the, fix the problem. Uh, so just wanted to finish up just by uh, mentioning, just by giving you a very quick uh, look at the uh, documentation that we have online. So I mentioned, so OpenHTMOD is open source project. Um, originally, it was developed for uh, as part of the XMS project uh, to support the Xseed systems, but the software itself is freely available for download. I think we have at least 300 and something sites that we know have downloaded and used it, and that number could be well well in excess of that. Those are only the people that we know about. Um, and installing the software and getting started is very quick and easy. So we have comprehensive documentation on the website, which is available in the PowerPoint slides, but it's open.xtmod.org. Um, if I just bring up the RPM installation guide, we provide RPMs that you can download. So if you're on the CentOS 7 system, install the RPM. You run our interactive setup script. You take the information from your resource manager that you, ex that you can export, or in fact, we provide scripts that will export it directly, import it into XtMod, and you're good to go. Um, uh, one of my uh, colleagues, Steve, I think, did a demonstration of getting XtMod up and running, and he had the whole thing going from scratch in about 25 minutes, or something, including explaining in detail slowly to people how to do it. So it is very quick to get up and running if you're just putting the accounting data in. And then we have the optional modules for, for example, the application kernels is an optional module that you can install. So once you have XtMod up and running with your accounting data, you can then switch on your uh, application kernels, put, install the module on there and have that infrastructure available to you. We have the optional module for the job performance information, so you can instrument your compute nodes, collect all that information, process it, and they have that available in XtMod. Uh, you can install the storage uh, or enable the storage uh, infrastructure, collect your storage information from your, power, from your file systems and ingest that into XtMod, and you can enable your cloud infrastructure and get your cloud data in there as well, have that all available. Uh, tie it into your uh, authentication system that's already in place. Users won't even need to create new accounts. They ha will have access to the system. So I think that's about it I wanted to talk about today. Are there any questions? So thank you uh, both Joe and, and Bob for uh, really uh, great dig into this. Uh, I didn't know much about this going in. Uh, so this has uh, been really great for giving me a little bit of an education about what this system does. 
So uh, I'll remind people that if you do have questions, uh, either unmute yourself if you're in a quiet area uh, to ask them or use the chat feature and I can repeat them uh, uh, out for Joe and Bob. Um, I had a couple that I had written down. Uh, I guess the, the first one that I really wanted to, to get a feeling of was, is really the primary use case for this to be sort of a, a reporting infrastructure to use for you know understanding usage patterns and things like that? Or do people put this in because they anticipate or want to help their users uh, fix problems or try to un better understand performance profiling? Or, or is it really just a, a combination of both? Uh, I guess the answer is it, it does both very well. Um, and uh, you know, we the people who are, it, it depends on your, that's why it's role, ba it, ro role based because if you're a center director, you're, you're interested in the first type of thing you're talking about, tracking usage, how, well, how efficient is your, is your system, who's using it to do what. Whereas if you're a user support person, you're, you're much more interested in uh, what, what, you know, the job viewer and how, how all these other things can be used to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to help you do your job, which is to tell to instruct the users and help them uh, use the system. Okay. And I had a, another one. Um, because I, I work with a lot of people in trying to, to better understand performance over networks, are there a lot, are there any network metrics that are sort of available uh, from this system, whether it be on the interconnect level or the the externally facing Ethernet la layer, uh, or is it really just sort of focused more on uh, CPU and memory and things of that nature? Uh, yeah, I mean, we so for the with the job performance uh, part of it, we're collecting the metrics on the compute nodes themselves. So anything that you can easily get hold of on the compute nodes, then we can get into the system. We do have I'm showing here the uh, you know we're collecting things like the interconnect usage. Uh, this particular metric that you're looking at on the screen now is one that's collected via um, via the from the switches that are connected to the compute nodes themselves, but on a per compute node basis. Um, uh, we collect like you know Ethernet information. We have those statistics in the system as well. Um, the one uh, met metric that we don't currently have the capability to like do much with is the sort of external metrics. So for example, data transfers to and from your HPC resource, um, which is something we're investigating. But on a, certainly on a per HPC job basis, looking at the data traveling to and from the compute nodes on an HPC job, yeah, we have that information. Um, yeah, so what, about a 30 second granularity here? Is yeah, so what we at? do, I mean, so um, what we do at our center we use Performance Copilot, and then we have it configured every 30 seconds to collect information. Um, and also, we collect information at the start and end of the job, so we can capture, you know, things that have happened, over the you know, total data transfer over the job. Um, that then, that's a sort of good compromise of the amount of data that you have to store versus getting you know, the granularity that you can see something useful. Now, you know, if you have somebody that's interested in on a per clock cycle performance measurements, that's not going to be suitable for them. They're likely to be running their own sort of like dedicated instrumented piece of software. Uh, but certainly for a good compromise of not having a too big a or a noticeable impact on the overall performance of jobs running on the system and being able to get some useful information about it, that's the number that we've, we've chosen. Uh, but you're not limited to using performance copilot to get the data. We've, uh, we did an analysis on the, on Blue Waters uh, and they were using, uh, LDMS uh, to collect the data at a 60 second granularity, if I remember correctly, uh, which we're able to cope with and ingested that into a dedicated OpenXT mod instance that, the, that we use there for that analysis. Um, we know of folks that have used Ganglia successfully, um, and uh, we also use TACStats as well, which is a piece of monitoring software that's developed from uh, by TAC. Uh, I think the TACStats that runs at uh, Stampede2, I think they switched to a two minute interval. Uh, they changed it for the night's landing now. I don't yeah. remember what the interval was. Historically, it was 10 minutes, but yeah. night's landing is a little shorter. Than yeah, the they uh, they, that does bring up a point that this is a very low overhead system. It's a, it's a uh, you know, small fraction of a percent. We've never actually even been able to detect the, you know, what, what sort of a overhead this uh, the software introduces uh, in, on your, on your uh, system. Okay. Yeah. Very, very helpful. 
Yeah, I mean, we also have uh, you know file system metrics as well that we collect. Uh, uh, what do we have like? Oh, in this case, you know NFS. So oh, he's not really using much. Oh, it looks like there's a big write out at the end. So I'm not explaining what that job was. So NFS data. We use GPFS here, so we've got a plugin to get GPFS data and then Lustre data as well. I think we use. Um, we we have support to be able to get information about that into the into the database. Um, All right. Uh, we haven't had any other questions, so I'll, I'll thank you both again uh, for the great presentation. Uh, if you can, just shoot me the uh, the couple of slides that you had, or I'll make sure that those get posted along with the video. Yeah. Um, hope everybody has a good weekend. Uh, for those that are still on, next week's talk is going to be from Von Welch and Susan Sons, and they are going to be talking about Trusted CI and the Research SOC uh, a project from Indiana and some other partners. So have a good weekend. We'll talk to everybody soon.